Super. Well, thanks, Gil, very much. I, I, I thought it would be helpful to the audience to understand a little bit about how the UK is thinking about how we go forward in this space. And this comes from a major government initiative which was started about three years ago, which was called the Industrial Strategy. And they, the government realized that things were going to get a bit choppy. I think they didn't realize how choppy they were actually going to get. But anyway, let's leave that aside. Um, and they decided to introduce a policy whereby they would invest into certain areas of potential economic growth for the company, for, for the country, and that uh, they would identify strategies around a number of those domains. And the first strategy that they chose and they asked me to lead was in the areas of life sciences. So I've been busy over the last couple of years building a wider strategy for life sciences in the UK. Uh, and it won't surprise you to hear that if you're trying to create opportunities in this space, it's really valuable to think about what's worked and, and how that influences what you do in the future. And so you will see, as I talk about it, how UK Biobank has actually had a profound influence on many of the things we're doing across other projects in the life sciences uh, industrial strategy. So we produced a report two years ago, um, which describes in great detail the sort of things we're going to want to do. And the, the, the highlights of the strategy sit around many of the strengths that we have in the UK. First of all, a commitment to strengthen the science base, which underpins much of, this, of the activity that we have, but also to enhance our abilities to do clinical trials, particularly using digital data to do clinical trials. Uh, obviously. Uh, scaling innovative companies is an issue for the UK, and there's a commitment to that. Trying to identify the new therapeutic platforms, particularly those in the cell and nucleic acid-based therapy space. And then some domestic aspects of adoption in the NHS. But central to this was the idea that we would try and create support for three new healthcare or life sciences industries in the UK. And that was probably the cent central pillar for the whole strategy. And of course, when you start to think about that, you know, it's, it's not good enough to say, well, let's build another pharma company, because that's not really going to work. So you need to think about things that are going to expand and develop over the next 20 years into major industrial sectors and major research activities over the next 20 years. And the first one is obviously genomics. And this has been driven by a whole load of activities in the UK, really going back a very long way to the sequencing of the genome. And, and has an influence on a variety of different territories. The technology under which we, with which we do sequencing, precision medicine, obviously for pharma target discovery, but also increasingly potential important aspects of public health. The second big domain is again an area where, which is very integrated with the genomics. And I think what has become really evident is that genomics on its own is kind of interesting, but the truth is it really generates interest when it's in the context of extensive phenotypic data. And the best place to get that phenotypic data is obviously from healthcare systems. And here I think the UK has a unique offering in healthcare data. We've got 65 million people uh, all now uh, in di digitized records. And one of the great things about UK Biobank, it was really the, it was the forerunner for accessing that data in a productive way to line up with all the other phenotypes that we have available. So our second big domain was uh, digital health. And we're now seeking a pretty large investment to try and curate and structure all the data within NHS digital systems so that it would be available for uh, a range of these projects. And then the third big space is in the area of public health, really, but early diagnosis. So the ability to identify people with disease earlier in their life history is, I think, a crucial bit for all healthcare systems. At the moment, we treat people late. In some bits of this country, half the cancer patients are diagnosed in the A&E department. That's not very helpful. And moving the diagnostic paradigm much earlier is an important piece of changing healthcare generally. And over the next 10 to 20 years, this is undoubtedly going to be a major industry in its own right. And so, Again, building off the terrific experience from UK Biobank on polygenic risk scores, we've designed a large prospective cohort that will allow us to do that at scale. And again, 
have had very substantial investment from government. So dropping back to the genomics, um, the, the goal of our genomic strategy is to try and get uh, 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 the genomes in UK Biobank sequence. There's a process in place bringing together a range of different partners. Uh, this was led by a commitment by the UK government of 100 million pounds to do this. We're bringing together a group of partners and we hope that that will yield a project sometime in the very near future. So that is a very exciting project and uh, I think Kerry in a minute is going to give you a justification for why you might want to do those sorts of projects. Um, we're also uh, now committed to sequencing 100,000 rare disease genomes every year for Genomics England. That's a big sequencing effort, but we'll also add to our genomic sequencing capabilities. The, the Public Health England is converting its microbiology to genomic sequencing at the moment. There have been a number of projects around specific pathogens, and that's being spread wider now. There are thoughts about whether we do neonatal screening with genomics, and that's still in discussion. Uh, the intention also is to try and run a program where we start by sequencing the genomes of, of 50,000 50, cancer patients every year uh, and then expand that over time. Uh, we're obviously, we're also very keen to expand the different sequencing platforms we're using. We're having helpful conversations with BGI and with Oxford Nanopore. Uh, and finally, as part of this, we're intending to use polygenic risk scores across the early diagnostic cohort, which will be 5 million people, which will start to embed that particular methodology in the public health arena. So in terms of large-scale genomics, this is broadly the picture, everything from sequencing in Biobank, which we hope to launch in the near future, the gel program, which is for which resource is committed by the NHS and will be expanding over the next few years, and then the early diagnostic cohort, which is largely public health and SNP-based. Uh, but will actually give us an opportunity to define high-risk subpopulations. Now, as I said earlier, and I think as Gil has alluded to, the, the truth is you really want the genomics in the context of a whole set of other healthcare data. And again, we're making real efforts to try and make that happen at scale. We've got a major digital pathology program, which is the biggest in the world, which we've launched. There are imaging programs, as well as just accumulating the routine health data in a way that people can get access to it. And this gives you a sort of summary of the assets that we've got in the UK on the data space, um, uh, which includes genomics, obviously, but much of this is built on the idea that getting access to those extensive and distributed healthcare data sets alongside um, our unique genomic access uh, uh, um, um, program is going to be a really exciting piece for this country to pursue. Um, the early diagnostic cohort I'll spend two minutes on, that's the cohort of 5 million people. We've had a commitment by government for 80 million pounds to get this started, uh, and we expect in the end to raise close to 300 million pounds to make this work. We've got commitments from both industry and charities to help make that happen. The idea is to use it to test a whole range of new diagnostic tools, but also to collect samples as you lead up to disease in a repeated sampling framework to allow you to go back from incident disease patients to identify markers in disease that predict um, uh, those disorders, but also to create high-risk subcohorts using the PRS as a methodology and ultimately to identify the people with early disease and see whether therapies work in early disease rather than late disease, and of course cancer is the poster child for that. And this is a, a slide which gives you a sense as how we're going to make this work. We're going to consent 5 million people, healthy individuals aged 30 to 75. Uh, we'll do polygenic risk scores in all of them to identify high-risk sub-cohorts. So if you take the highest 3 or 5 percent, you get, you know, more than 150,000 people who are at very high risk of disease. Those can then be intensively sampled, but we'll also have a set of repeated blood samples, which we'll do in a million people, where we'll take a blood sample every year until they develop incident disease. And so we think this is, again, all dependent on UK Biobank, where this whole study is being built off the expertise this country gained from Rory and his colleagues as they developed the UK Biobank study, 
It's got some additional tweaks. We'll be returning data to patients. That's complicated. We'll be recalling patients, but we think it's the next obvious step forward for this program. So, as you can see, the life sciences industrial strategy is very much biobank plus uh, using our, the expertise we've gained from that and the special characteristics of the UK healthcare system to take it forward. So, thanks, Gil.